The problems um, are, are, I hope you everyone has seen them, and uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a smorgasbord of things. There's lots of things you can choose to decide what you, they're, I think, all important and interesting, but you know, there's just too much to do. So you guys can decide where you want to put your effort. You can pick and choose from different parts. Accessible to you. All right. And uh, yeah, we do have the spring break that follows. So this, I will assign so you can, you know, and what you where you are. But we'll have a, a, a lighter assignment the following week. All right. Okay. Very good. So uh, last time we uh, were talking about EPR. Just, I, I assume that. Everyone has seen this nowadays in their quantum mechanics courses. I think it's taught, generally speaking. It wasn't back in the day, but I think it probably is now. Nonetheless, I, it's good to think about it again, even if you've thought about it before. And um, as I've also sort of, as I've said, you know, quantum optics took off as a field because it was a form in which these ideas can be put to the test. And um, we'll talk uh, this week particularly about how we do that and how we create the entangled sources that are necessary uh, for uh, this kind of test of local realism um, and other such foundational questions. Okay, so um, the the key was EPR's notion that look, come on, people, it's got to be the case that if I can predict the outcome that someone is going to see, and there's no way that I can have sent the signal to. <coughs> measure that experimenter because that person is outside my light cone and I know for sure what they're going to find then it must have been the case that there was something locally realistically there for that person to then have found that outcome right and uh it could be random, that person may not know what outcome they're going to find because they don't have full information about the state of their system. But if I can, if I know for sure what they're going to find, then uh, it must be the case that it, it was something, they just discovered it, okay? That makes perfect sense. And um, you know, EPR used that to argue that quantum mechanics was incomplete because they should, they argued that both the position and momentum of a distant observer can be predicted, and thus, in this way, are both elements of reality, and then thus both their exists a definite value of x and a definite value of p and don't tell me otherwise because that's logic okay of course you know Bohr just sort of said no you can't really say that because you know unmeasured outcomes have no reality and you're not measuring x and p at the same time and that's a different experiment and you know fine that was how it was left in 1934 uh, but there, you know, you can argue about that, but there was nothing uh, quantitative that would distinguish these different points of view um, until John Bell, 30 years later. Uh, so John, John Bell wanted to really put these ideas to the test. Um, and uh, you know, introduce the idea of a local hidden variable theory.
which is to say there's a hidden variable that is, if we knew it, or a set, you know, it's a set of variables, that if we knew them would completely determine what the measurement outcome is, right? Uh, but we just don't know what that is, but it exists somewhere in the world. Um, and thus, if there are two parties, Alice and Bob, and Alice's outcome, measurement outcome, depends on what that bubble hidden variable is. Okay? You know, what the value is depends on the measurement setting. So this is the measurement setting. So she's going to measure something. A says something about the setting that she's of her measurement apparatus. And lambda is the things that determine what the outcome will be. And this is the outcome, capital A. Okay. So there's Alice. Of course, there's Bob. And his measurement outcome depends on whatever the local hidden variables are and his measurement setting. But importantly, what makes this a local hidden variable theory is that Bob's measuring outcome in no way depends on what setting Alice chose. And uh, Alice's measurement outcome in no way depends on what setting Bob chose. They both depend on the same local hidden variables but what makes it local is that fact, okay? And then there's some probability distribution that determines that's a, what the local hidden variables might be, okay? So again, you know, my favorite experiment, here's the local hidden variable, it's in my head, what I'm going to do, right? Oopsie, now everyone saw it. <laughs> Sean gets to do the experiment today. Close your eyes. Don't cheat. Open your hand. You saw there were two colors of, of cats, right? One was orange and one was blue. I'm going to go into the other room now, look at your thing, and predict what it's going to be. Say it out loud. Orange. <laughs> Ta -da! It's orange. Okay? You could predict with certainty what it was going to be. Now, yeah, maybe you know, I was an outside the light home, but it sort of depends. So it could have been. Very slow light. Yeah. If you don't say it fast enough, then you would. It's true. And the local hidden variable was what in that case? Well, it was. The, the, you know, the, my choice of putting which cap into his hand, okay? And that was done, you know, randomly, but it existed in the world. I knew, because I saw it, he didn't know, but that's fine, okay? Right, so, um, with this, we can ask something about, for example, the average value of Alice's outcome given her uh, variable that she measures her setting, uh, little a, would be the average over the local hidden variables. And we can also look at the correlation between what a Alice and Bob measure and the, the, the outcomes can be correlated as they would be, as they were in that very sophisticated experiment that we just did, that measurement outcomes are correlated in a very particular way, okay? And we know how they're gonna be correlated because we saw the setup and everyone agreed to it and there was nothing up my sleeve, at least you will not believe that, okay? So, um, the question is, so what John Bell showed is that a local hidden variable uh, model implies 
certain inequalities. possible given a local hidden variable theory. Okay. Now, or the original Bell inequality was relied on a perfect experiment. Now, firstly, as I, as, before I get into that, I should mention that, as we emphasize that, actually this state is the limit of a physical, this is not a physical state, as we dis discussed, because it requires us to have infinite energy. We can't have two delta functions. We can get darn close, though. But if we had such a state, that state, there is a local hidden variable theory because, as you will see if you do problem three, I forgot which one it is, in the homework this week, this is the limit of a two-mode squeeze state, which has a completely classical description in terms of correlated positions and momenta, okay? Uh, and uh, to get at this problem, uh, David Bohm, who was interested in foundations around the 1950s, uh, thought about uh, EPR revisited with Thin correlations. Okay, which has the advantage of B, I mean A, <laughs> that we, it's a physical state we can make, and B, the there is not a local hidden variable theory that would describe the measurements that we would do on the steps. Okay, and he thought about the spin singlet. which is sometimes called a Bell state, or it's one of these days what we call a Bell state. Or two spin one half particles. Now, the singlet state, as we know, is an eigenstate of the total spin magnitude zero, which means that the spin projection along any direction of this state is zero. So if I look at the projection of the total spin, which is sigma for A tensor the identity plus the identity tensor sigma B. That's the total spin projection for the half. Acting on the singlet, that's zero because it's got spin zero and therefore it has spin projection zero along any direction in space. Thus, what this says is that the singlet has anti-correlation. Let me write just because there's so many. This is A, B, A, B, because the subscript will be the direction, and the superscript will be R U Alice or Bob. So they're anti-correlated, as we know. Perfectly anti-correlated. Okay. So the fact that this thing is an eigenstate of that means that if I do a measurement of spin projection along some direction, I'm Alice, I can predict for sure that Bob is going to get the opposite value. If I see spin up, 
mean, it's just a contrarian. He says, spin down. I say, spin down. He says, spin up. No matter what direction I look in, Bob is a quant contrarian to Alice, and Alice is a contrarian to Bob. There's just no way to get around it. Okay? Um, so, um, let's. Um, so, if I have, you know, this singlet state or this belt state, this particular bell state, and we send off the two spins in these two different directions, and we were to put them in a stern gerlach device along some axis, it doesn't matter what axis it is, then, you know, this guy goes to the up direction, then this guy will go to the down direction. And you'll always see those anti-correlations. So with that, um, Bell defines some inequalities that the singlet state would satisfy. Or I should say, let me say it this way, that the singlet state would violate. Okay. Now, the original Bell's inequality assumed that it had a perfect singlet state in order for that violation to happen. And of course, you know, we can't do that. So um, when this was revisited sometime in the later 1970s, and that's a, a great and amazing story. So um, as some of you may know, we'll talk a little bit more about it, a couple of years ago, the Nobel Prize for the measurements and violation of, of Bell's inequality was given by the Nobel Committee. And one of the recipients is a guy named John Clauser. John Clauser did the first experiments and did the first, you know, was the first to kind of say, hey, let's really do that. He's an interesting character. Uh, I, I knew him as a grad student. He was uh, a research faculty member at Berkeley where I was, where I was a graduate student. And there's a, a famous uh, set of stories in, in a book that I highly recommend called How the Hippies Saved Physics. Have you ever have you heard of that book? It, it's a great book. I highly recommend it. It's, it's a great read for spring break. And, and you know, the story of, 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 of the book is about how, you know, in the late, uh, sometime in the 70s, well, you know, sometime after Sputnik was uh, put up, the first uh, Russian satellite and, and, and the US flipped out, there was a huge, we need more physicists. Let's make PhD, let's have as many PhDs as we were. We're in trouble, we're gonna get Bob. And so, you know, all of these programs are high in physicists, left and right and right and left and left and right. And then, you know, by the late 1960s, early 1970s, well, maybe we don't need that many physicists. And there were no jobs for uh, physicists. So there were just a lot of people just kind of, you know, grad PhDs who were just spinning their wheels trying to figure out what to do. And so this was, you know, sometime, I don't know, in the early 1970s. And um, so, you know, there were these groups that got together to work on things. And there was one particular group in, in uh, around UC Berkeley, where there was, of course, the big hippie movement at the time. And there was this mix of mysticism and physics. And somehow these folks um, discovered John Bell's work. I mean, no one paid any attention. I mean, you know, do you think Feynman gave a crap about John Bell? In 1961, did not. Uh, no one paid any attention to this. But you know these guys, and especially back then, you know the, there was this sort of mystic culture, kind of east, you know, sort of a little bit of mix of Eastern culture. You know, the Beatles went to India and all of that, and um, and the idea of extrasensory perception was a, an ESP, as it was called in the day. Like you know, I can read your mind, right? And of course, entanglement was really 
a kind of a way you might be able to do that, right? Maybe there was really some physics behind uh, uh, this. So a guy named Jack Safardi, whom also, you know, with all these activities, he still hung out in, in Berkeley in, in when I was there. That was like around 1990, plus or minus three years. Um, uh, and um, anyway, so they, they discovered that, and John Clouser somehow, I mean, he was a student of Charlie Towns, I think. Charlie Towns won the Nobel Prize in Gentile. The laser, basically, the laser. Uh, and, but, you know, didn't really like what they, you know, at that point they were doing astrophysics and, you know, found this thing, you know, hung out with the hippies and said, hey, we can. And John Clauser didn't believe in quantum mechanics. He just didn't think it was right. So he said, let's do this experiment. It's got to show that quantum mechanics is wrong. And that was, and they dug up, like, you know, old parts in somebody's lab, did it with some other postdoc, Stuart Friedman, who sadly died uh, relatively young. Um, and, uh, okay, so that's interesting. Piece of yeah, go on. There's, there's a, I just, to follow up on the hippies, one of them is still alive, Nick Herbert. He's 87 and he lives in a treehouse. He's still, he's still. Well, Nick Herbert is important because yeah. without Nick Herbert, we wouldn't have the no cloning theory. Right. It's a whole other story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of them are still alive. So is John Clown. Okay. He's won Nobel Prize, and so is Jack Safari. You can follow him on Twitter and see. He still believes. This, one, this one's like in a treehouse. Yeah, like, yeah. He Jack Safari walks around in, 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 you know, in a beret. Yeah, and, okay. you know. <laughs> uh, um, so, anyway. Well, so Clauser was, you know, he was a he was a, a serious experimental physicist uh, in AMO physics, atomic uh, molecular optical physics, and and they wanted to do this experiment. They didn't do it with uh, um, electrons, which is one half, but they did it with 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 photons. We'll come back to that because that's what I said. The quantum optics. The photons are in spin one half. There's been one, but there are two orthogonal states, so you have a qubit. You can talk about the polarization states of light and map that onto the, the spin, as we know, any qubit can be mapped to a spin one half particle. Okay. And they defined what are not what's known right now as or known now as a CHSH inequality. stands for Clauser, Horn, Shimini, and Holt, who were all folks interested in the foundations back in the day. And they considered the, the following uh, observable. So let's consider the following observable. Um, So, this is a bipartite observable corresponding to uh, some spin component along some direction A. So, I'm going to have E sub n dot sigma as sigma sub n. That's the direction of the spin. Okay? So, this is spin along that direction for Alice, and the difference in the spin components along B and B prime for Bob, added or, you know, added to the component along A prime and the sum of those guys, okay? So they said, let's consider that observable. Yeah, one of them is B and the other is B prime. I'm sorry, I'm still trying to remember to get something this correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So the local hidden variable 
model would say, given lambda, there's some outcome that Alice will see that depends on that lambda and that particular of that particular measurement setting times the value that B would get with that lambda and that setting minus that. And there's some similar expression over here. Okay, everyone with me? So if we had lambda, this is what the outcome would be according to the local hidden variable model. Okay? We don't know what it is, but we can take the average of it or some statistics thereof. Now, what is true though is that whatever the value is, every one of these values for the spin one half, no matter what <coughs> the setting is, is just a binary outcome. It's either up or down. And if I use the eigenvalues of the Pauli's, it's plus one or minus one, okay? Moreover, what we know in this problem is that, uh, that there is this anti-correlation between uh, these guys. Well, we'll see how that will come out. But the bottom line of this is that either one of these guys is either plus one or minus one, okay? Um, and so there are different possibilities of the outcomes. Either they're both the same, they're both plus one, or one of them is plus one and the other one is minus one. Right? So this value over here can either be zero or plus or minus two. That's the only possibilities, right? Because each one of these things is either a plus one or a minus one. So either they're the same, in which case it would be zero. It's not about the state itself, it's just the values can be either plus one or minus one, right? And this guy can be plus or minus one. Similarly, this guy can be plus or minus one, right? However, if these guys were the same, then it has to be the opposite, right? So this guy is plus or minus two or zero in the exact opposite way, right? Either, if these two guys are the same, this would be zero, in which case this would be either plus two or minus two. If these guys are opposite, well, this guy is zero, which means that this thing is always plus or minus two, which some, we don't know what value it's gonna be, but it's either gonna be plus two or minus two. So it's nothing about the state, other than the fact that the outcome is either plus one or minus one. Okay, which means that if I were to look at the average of this thing, um, of the magnitude of this, it's always the same. It's actually the magnitude of this guy is, is two, right? However, what that, what the, if I look at the magnitude of the average, that has to be, in this case, less than or equal to this, right? Because sometimes this could be subtracted so that the average can never be uh, bigger than that magnitude too. And that's the CHMJ inequality. It's very straightforward. Okay, so uh, if we have a local hidden variable theory, then what it says is that the um, average of the correlation between the two spins in this way
right? Everyone with me? So that's what a local hidden variable says, and that's the CHSH inequality. Okay? It doesn't say anything about the state other than we have these two outcomes, plus one and minus one. So now we can ask, what does quantum mechanics say? Well, what quantum mechanics says is if I look at the expectation value of this, correlation between the spins along two different directions. Do you know what that is? Say I measure, I have two, two um, parties, A and B. One's going to measure, do a stern gerlach experiment along some direction in space, denoted by the unit vector N. The other one by unit vector m. Well, if they were the same, this would be minus one, right? And if they're orthogonal to one another, it's going to be zero. So the answer you can check is this. Okay. So with that, what this says is that the CHH SH inequality. says that the magnitude of A dot B minus A, jeez, uh, this one should have been, B prime, that's all for right. So A dot B prime minus A dot B plus a prime dot b prime Let's double check that, make sure I've got everything right. Yeah, that's correct. So what's what is what is what is this saying? Let's go back and let's think about this now from the point of view of my EPR type experiment. I have my correlated spins in the effective spin singlet case. There's going to be a measurement done, which I can correspond to a measurement along some direction A, or a measurement along some direction A prime. Bob is going to do his measurement. He has two possible measurement settings, which we haven't yet defined what they are, B and B prime. The question is, is our, this is what quantum mechanics tells us is this correlation function, which corresponds to not a particular measurement outcome, but the average over many measurements, such that I can calculate the expectation value of these correlations. Okay. So it's not corresponding to a single run of the experiment. I need many, many members of the ensemble to which I get some fraction of outcomes 
to which I would then assign an approximation to the expected value, right? And in particular, let's suppose that it turns out that I can get the best violation if I choose everything to be in the plane and the equal angle is supposed to be equal to these. So this is So if I choose the measurement settings such that one of Bob's measurement settings by, bisects the directions, and we'll come back to what this means physically, how we would choose this, then what is this side of the equation? Well, A prime times B prime is cosine of three theta, and then everything else is the same. So the question is, is there a choice of theta which violates it? And the answer is yes. It's when theta is in some range, when theta is 45 degrees. So if I look at what this guy looks like uh, as a function, actually instead of, hang on, let me, let me sketch it for you here. So as a function of theta, this guy, There's plus two, there's minus two, looks like this. Where this value is at 45 degrees and minus 45 degrees, or, and this value here is two by two. I get the maximum violation of those inequalities at that point. How would I, what kind of experiment can I do to show this? What does that 45 degrees mean? So remember that I can think about the, these directions as being on equivalently on the Poincaré sphere. For polarization, which is the block sphere for polarization, okay? So for example, this could be um, the uh, horizontal direction and this the vertical direction. This would be linear polarization. This would be diagonal and anti-diagonal, but so these guys, in this case, are separated. In this case, uh, these two, um, on the case of the spin, right, this corresponds to a 90 degrees angle, okay? When I say, when you see the, the, the thing that's at 45 degrees, it means that I'm doing something, I'm doing something which is 45 degrees on the Poincaré sphere, which is half of 45 degrees, right, or 22.5 degrees along a linear direction. Okay. So what this would correspond to is I have these two photons that go off that are entangled, right, where on one side I measure 
Alice can, I can choose my polarizing settings to be corresponding to HV or A prime, which is, you know, 40, this would be 90 degrees away over here would be diagonal and anti-diagonal, right? Whereas over here, these guys are rotated by 22 and a half degrees. They're both these two polarizing settings, right, where one is at 45 degrees with respect to the other, but then the other two bisect them. Okay, and so let me just show you a little picture here. Oh, I guess before I do that, there's an important thing. So how are you actually gonna measure this stuff? Well, I mean, in principle, you can, uh, measure each, have a detector at each output port here and measure whether you get a click or not. And then uh, just multiply them together and average them appropriately. However, the problem is, you know, some of the photons may go off in some funny directions, and moreover, the detector doesn't always click because there's not perfect detection efficiency. And so you're gonna get weird correlations having to do with your imperfect detection. So what you really wanna do is look for coincidence. That's to say, when both detectors go click, you might still have weird stuff because you have dark counts and all kinds of crap in your real lab, sorry, but you know, the temperature fluctuates, it really screws things up, what are you gonna do? Uh, but you do what you can. Um, and so what one measures here is the following. One says, okay, let's, Let's look at this object, this S over here, in terms of uh, what this is. I have the Pauli operator associated with spin up and spin down along a particular measurement direction. And then I have similarly for B, or B prime. And so on to the other term. Okay. So, So what I have over here is a particular sigma A, sigma B expectation value in this case would be equal to, if I look at say this particular term, it's gonna be the probability of both being up that's this and that term. And then plus the probability that 
they're both down, minus the probability that the first guy is up and the second guy is down, minus the probability that uh, the second guy is down and the first guy is up. Right? So, how would I try to estimate this in the experiment? What I do is I look for the number of uh, coincidence counts where those settings were done and the number of coincidence counts that happened where I got both of them to be down minus the number of coincidence counts where the first guy is up and the second guy is down minus the other way around divided by the sum of these guys is the total number of coincidences. So by doing things this way, I'm looking at a sub-ensemble. I'm not looking at every bell pair that is produced. I'm only looking at the ones where both of my detectors went click. They could have gone, both gone click in these four different ways because I'm gonna have on these measurements, either can go through one port of the polarizing beam splitter or the other port of the beam splitting cruiser. So they either go both this way, both that way, both this way, both that way, and I look at the number of coincidence counts. I add and subtract them in this way, divided by the total number of coincidence counts, and that gives me that correlation function. And when the measurement was done, ta-da! We violated Bell's inequalities. So what do we think about that? What does that tell us about the nature of the universe? Uh, the nature of life, universe, everything. Yeah, 3042, but that was not the setting they chose. <laughs> you know, we can either, you know, one can say, well, there is reality, but it's non-local in the sense that what I'm doing is, is affecting you in a way that is Superluminal. Now, actually, John brought up this gentleman living in the treehouse who, you know, tried to show how using entanglement I could send signals faster than the speed of light. But it turns out you can't. Um, there's no way to do that if you try to do that. Quantum mechanics does not allow, even non-relativistic quantum mechanics, interestingly, which has nothing to do with cause, you know, relativistic causality, doesn't allow for signaling faster than the speed of light. So it's kind of, you know, you could say that's true, but it's kind of useless because there is no causal relationship between what I do and what outcome you're going to see. There is none. There is no causal relationship between Alice and what Alice chooses to measure and what Bob finds. There's no information in Bob's state that has anything to do with Alice's measure because we know that the marginal state is just a random pitch drift. So, I don't know, is that a good resolution to this? Ah, that's thumbs down. Uh, maybe. But, you know, the other thing is, then what? I think it, it's one of these things that just remains 
a, 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 an unsettled piece of business in our thinking about how we even think about what, or what is it that we're actually talking about when we're saying we find something, what are we, at what point does the, it come into <laughs> existence, so to speak, if it didn't exist prior? And what does it even mean? What, 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 what does it take to bring something into existence? What kind of physical processes count as bringing something into existence? And what kind of physical processes don't? Do I have something to do with it? I don't know. But I'll leave that for you. Um, I just wanted to just flash on a couple of things here. Negative probability is another way to explain violations of those inequalities. Because this, you know, this inequality assumed a positive probability distribution. If I have a negative probability distribution, then I can violate that. So it's an interesting question, I think. OK, what did I want to show you? Um, I want to show you a couple of things. Uh, one I wanted to show you uh, was, so here, oops. So just mentioning some of the history of, of, of these things, the original experiment by John Clauser was done in 1972. It was kind of inconclusive. They really couldn't see a, a real violation of those inequalities. And that really just had to do with the detectors and the sources at the time. The real first definitive test that showed this was done by Alain Espe, um, uh, and you know, and they asked. Actually, I don't think that year is right. Uh, it's 1989, I believe, is when that experiment was done. I know that, and maybe you know, yeah, I have to remind myself uh, when that was done. But it was, I think it was in the, sometime in the late 1980s. This is a sketch of the kind of experiment that was done in Aspe's lab where they have polarizing beam splitters, you see, and they can choose, depending upon the setting that they have, different settings, and they can look at the, the individual counts or the coincidence counts between all these different ports. Okay. Um, the sources that produced this kind of, of correlated photon at that time, both in the experiment from Clauser and later by Aspe, were atomic gases. And they were of the sort that we talked about last semester. You may remember when we talked about heralding photons. Photon. Um, uh, and, you know, that happened in, in a, in a two-photon excitation and then spontaneous cascade and the correlated photons, uh, so that. In the late 1980s, and what we'll talk about starting, I guess, next time, uh, 
newer sources were developed based on solid state crystals, nonlinear optical crystals, and the process of spontaneous parametric down conversion, the three-way mixing process we discussed a little bit some weeks ago. And those can create incredibly bright sources of entangled photons. They're kind of the workhorse of entangled photons these days. Moreover, detectors got better. Paul Quiat did really good, you know, one of the seminal experiments that showed a 100 uh, standard deviation violation of Bell's inequalities. Yeah. Um. On, uh, on a historical note, yeah. Aspe's experiment, the experimental realization of the Gedanken experiment, um, it was actually submitted in 1981, just barely in 1981, December 30th of that year, and wasn't published until July of, uh, of 82. Okay, all right, so it was, yeah. There was something, I think what happened in the late 80s was the first um, delayed choice experiment was done. So there were various subtle loopholes associated with the Bell's inequalities. Um, the, the question of locality, were the two detectors really outside each other's light cones? So the first experiments that showed that were in the late 80s. Okay. Um, there's issues about fair sampling. You're only looking at a sub-ensemble is the sub-ensemble maybe only the piece of the ensemble that you saw if you you know violates the bell's inequalities but if you if you actually took everything else and averaged it maybe it, it would satisfy those inequalities and not violate it all these loopholes were closed in a series of experiments that were done almost 10 years ago now christ um, and uh, um, God, this time fly. And one of the important uh, contributors to this, this experiment by Paul Quiet was done in the lab of Anton Zeiler. And those, Paul was my classmate. We were in, in grad school together at the same time. But these guys all won the Nobel Prize for uh, this, these experiments in uh, 2022, and you know what the what the Nobel Committee said was this is for experiments with entangled photons establishing the violation of Bell's inequalities and pioneering what information science, which I also think is a very interesting story. Did John Cloud know anything about what information science or Alan S. Bay for that matter? They did that, those words didn't even exist. Uh, um, why the hell did they do those experiments? There was no interest in making a quantum computer that they can make a lot of money with. Uh, it was, we want to understand the nature of the universe and put some fundamental question to the test. And this is what got me into the field, actually, the reason I know, I was thinking it was in the late 1980s, because that's when I started grad school, and Alan S. Bay's delayed choice experiment was in an, in, a, in an article in Scientific American. That was a magazine we read back in the day. And um, I remember my, when going to my, my classmate, who was a TA with me, and he had a copy of that article on his desk. I said, because I'd read it, I was blown away. I'd never heard of any of this. And uh, I said, that is the coolest thing, didn't you? He said, oh yeah, well, great chat. I was setting up a lab. Um, I'm gonna go work with it. And I said, really, people do that here? And, and that's how I, I, how I got into this. Because I was, you know, like many of you, just wanted to understand what the heck quantum mechanics is about. And I think it's just an interesting lesson for us because you never know where curiosity-based research is gonna take you. The idea of exploring the foundations of quantum mechanics, no one knew that that could be a billion dollar technological, now maybe it'll be a bust of a technological, I don't know, we'll see those sometime. 
but, uh, 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 but nonetheless, it is right now, and is there something that, that will come through? And I think it's an important, I think it's just an important lesson, you know, I get to stand on the bully pulpit, so I'm gonna do it. It's important as scientists to ask the hard questions and understand what they are and then pursue them because you never know where it's gonna go. All right, I'm preaching to the choir, so. Uh, also, it's interesting, amen. Yeah, it's interesting to note that nobody was willing to fund John Clauser to oh, yeah. do the experiment, so yeah. he went into the junkyard in yeah. Berkeley lab and was like, you can be this, this, and this, it's and true. I'll try to make it work. Yeah, it's true, it was, it, it was just, and he, he was, was. Why are you doing this? He was really an interesting guy. I mean, he was the kind of guy who would use duct tape and, and you know, take a thermocouple and put it in his tongue to see if there was enough voltage on it. I mean, he was that kind of experimentalist. Uh, and, you know, no one would fund quantum optics, basically. I mean, in, in uh, you know, when I was a grad student, there were just a few groups. There was, I mean, the, 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 the Navy deserves a lot. The Office of Navy Research really funded all of this back in the day because they were they knew that this that could improve navigation and 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 that's where that was partly what was going on back in those days. Um, all right, so I just want to say. Hmm, now is generating entangled states of light. Um, before I do that, let me just remind our, ourselves about what does it take to make entanglement, okay? So if I think about some, inter some kind of interacting system, I can think about the Hamiltonian that describes that interacting system, okay? So if I have a bipartite system, The question is, will the, the nature of the dynamics create entanglement or not? If I have a Hamiltonian that describes the dynamics of this bipartite system, we write it in two different categories. It's either separable or non-separable. A separable Hamiltonian is one that the Hamiltonian acts locally on the two subsystems. So if the Hamiltonian of the joint system is the sum of Hamiltonians that act locally on each subsystem, then we say it's separable. Um, and in that case, the unitary time evolution associated with this is a product. Okay, so if the unitary evolution of the joint system locally acts as a unitary on A times unitary B, then we say that is separable. Separable of the Hamiltonian is the sum, separable of the unitary is the product. Okay? And otherwise, entangling. So if my unitary isn't this way, I mean, why is this called entangling? Because if I start with a product state, which is a, a, a separable state, 
apply this Hamiltonian, it will stay separable. Whereas if it's not of this form, then if I start with the product state, it will become an entangled state after some amount of time. Okay, and so I need the this. If this guy is separable, it's non-interacting. The two degrees of freedom are not interacting with one another. That's what it means. So there's a intimate relationship between the interaction between the degrees of freedom and the entanglement. They need to interact with one another in order to entangle with one another. Now, it's a very subtle business, though, in quantum optics and elsewhere, because as we also discussed, what is entangled or not depends on how we choose to separate or define the tensor product structure. What are the subsystems? Okay, so here's an example. Let's say I have one photon. And I can think about the momentum of the photon. Or position of the photon to some degree. So if I, I, I take this state of the single photon, it's in, it has some wave numbers. This is its momentum state. And I put it on a beam splitter. And it can be transmitted with some probability or amplitude. Or it can be reflected into this guy. Let's say it's a 50-50 beam splitter. So my initial state becomes a superposition of this momentum and that momentum, say with a certain phase. Is that an entangled state? Does it? No, I mean, it's just, it's one photon. There's no tensor product structure. And it just is in a superposition, like an electron that we, you know, we study in wave mechanics that can have to be in a superposition of two momenta. Or, you know, it could send it through on a beam splitter, like, or, or in a diffraction gradient, and that's not an entangled state. Or is it? I mean, it sort of depends what I'm looking at. So there is a beam splitter creates mode entanglement, not particle entanglement. Depends what degrees of freedom I'm talking about. Am I talking about the waves or am I thinking about the particles? And when I have the quantum field, the quantum wave is a kind of degree of freedom. So here's what I mean by that. Let's say that I think about two modes. Let me call it instead of one and two, let's call them A and B. If I send a, I have a single photon in mode A and nothing in mode B. I send that into this. What comes out? Well, either the photon was transmitted, that happened with some amplitude, say, Or it gets reflected, in which case there's nothing in this and one photon in that. Is that an entangled state? This caused a lot of debate amongst friends and frenemies. It's like, no, it's not an entangled state. It's one photon. It's not. 
this can't violate a Bell's inequality because there's no non-locality. But it is because I can use this as a resource for example for quantum tunnel partition, as we will see. It depends on what I measure. What I'm calling entangled or not depends on the measurements I do. Okay. And in particular, I can imagine the following uh, Gedanken experiment, or a real experiment, but let's just say, I'm gonna send this following output of this thing through a cavity with an atom in it. The atom could be either in the ground state or the excited state. Give me a cavity over here. Okay, I start the system with the atom in the ground state in the cavity. And I tune the cavity such that I have the James Cummings model, such that this photon passes through, it goes through an exact one vacuum photon, a single photon Rabi cycle, such that if a photon passes through this guy, it'll definitely get absorbed. Okay, so I start out with one photon in A and zero photons in B. Okay, and both atoms in the ground state. The atom that's sitting here in A and both atoms sitting here in B. What's going to happen once I send this thing through the beam splitter? Well, it goes like this which means that what happens is, after I go through the beam splitter, I have, there's no photons left, but I have a superposition, either it went through port A, which got the first guy hits, goes to the excited state, or it went through port B, in which case the second atom is definitely excited, deterministically. It's, for those who want to use language, I've done a swap gate through my cavity, which took this entanglement and swapped it into those. Now, would you say this is an entangled state? It sure is, right? I mean, I can, I can measure, do me the measurements on these qubits this is another Bell state. It's the one with the plus sign, but I would still violate a CHSH-like inequality associated with that. So one of the, the lessons here is that what I is entangled depends on um, what is the degree of freedom. And I want to talk about, I want to just say this in one last way in two minutes. <coughs> beam splitter Hamiltonian in second quantization looks like this. I annihilate a photon in mode A and create that photon in mode B. Or I annihilate a photon in B, create it in. This is an entangling Hamiltonian between the modes, right? Even though from the point of view of the particle, well, there's only one degree of freedom. And, but, you know, it's another thing that, you know, so this is another always have some pet peeves because you know I, that's just who I am you know what that means is that anything that is a superposition state can always be called an entangled state 
because you could always write in second quantization. I have one excite, I have a, a superposition of many different energy levels. It's like a multi-mode thing where I have one zero 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 plus zero one zero 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 plus just one excitation distributed. I say, oh, it's an entangled state. You know what? Photosynthesis, when the electron hops around, they're using entanglement. Well, it's just a superposition of the electron. It's, you, want, you can call it an entangled state because it sounds like it's, that's all oh, biology uses entanglement. Maybe not, uh, but okay. Pet peeve for the, the moment. Yeah. So, uh, so you're saying that the difference is in um, in the in the sort of the characteristic or the degree of freedom that we are looking at, and it's not just, for example, like rotation in some bases, right? That's for example. Correct. That's you correct. can uh, rotate and measure things in bell basis, in which case if you measure bell state right. and bell basis... A local, a local change of basis does not change the entanglement. Yeah. But a change in the tensor product structure yeah. changes. And this is the last thing I want to say on that part. So let's look at... Let's say I, I, I look at this kind of interaction and let's say there's a scattering matrix, U, that is, you know, the, you know, related to this Hamiltonian, that's related to this. We know that you say A, you dagger, um, gives me a superposition. And similarly for, for B. Then if I look at the position and what more X and P quadratures, then um, what let me get my get this right. That's to say, if I send light onto a beam splitter in mode A and mode B, then what comes out here is the difference in the quadratures, and what comes out here is the average of the sum of the quadratures. That is to say, this beam splitter interaction takes the individual, if I thought about these as like in position, the position of particle A and the position of particle B into the center of mass and relative coordinates. They're not the coordinates and relative coordinates of the photon. Please, that's not what they are. X and P are not the positional momentum of the photon. They're the quadratures of the field of the oscillator. But for, they have the same algebra thereof. But what this tells me, as we know, if I have something which is a product state in X, in A and B, it's an entangled state in the center of mass and relative coordinates, and vice versa. And so what this tells me is that in continuous variable quantum computing, a beam splitter is an entangling interaction. It, I can create an entangled state, well, not if I put two coherent states in, right? Because two coherent states, product states, I need something else, but if I put a squeeze back in here and a squeeze back in here, I'll get entanglement between those three states. 
that entanglement, as we'll come to see, is not enough to, as a source for quantum computing, it's still, it's a Clifford-like thing. It's like the C naught, which is entangling, but it's not, a, it's makes, it takes a Gaussian state to a Gaussian state, problem one. But it is an entanglement, but it's not entangling, I mean, the photons are talking to one another, right? It's linear optics. Photons aren't talking to each other, but the modes are talking to each other. That's right. So, you know, but there's no, yeah, the modes aren't talking to one another. In a, in a, and, I mean, it's, of course, as we also know, if I send a single photon here and a single photon there, what comes out is an entangled state. That's not, I could have zero, zero plus one, one from the Hongo Mandel effect. Again, this Hamiltonian, the beam splitter Hamiltonian, does have the modes interact with it. Even though each photon, photon by photon, is doing its own thing, the statistics, the, the identical particle statistics are still also play a role in this. There's a lot of subtlety, in my view, in thinking about the entanglement that happens when you're thinking about the quantized field. Let's hold some more of those thoughts. We'll, we'll pick this up. It's already well over time. But I want to I wanna, uh, mull it over and have to continue this time.